My name is Kat Stever, and I will be your monitor today. Um, and I just want to let you all know that there will be time for questions at the end of the presentation, and you can submit those to the chat. Um, please note that our guest labeled as technician is here to assist in recording today. And if you have any IT questions as an attendee, to visit the help desk in your attendee hub. But hopefully we won't have any more technology difficulties today. One day, one time a day is enough for me. Um, here we have Carol Valandia Pardo, and she is a licensed me uh, medical social, social worker. worker, which is part of my passion because I'm a I'm a social worker myself. Uh, she graduated from the University of Maryland as a graduate professor, language access advocate, and award-winning curriculum developer and founder and CEO of Equal Access Language Services. She developed the interprofessional curriculum, Effective Inclusion Through Language Access, which will be taught to three different schools at the University of Maryland in spring 2024. That is very exciting. And she and her company, her lovely uh, gang of interpreters, are providing the interpretation for the RPI Conference 2023. Um, as a social worker, interpreter, and academic, and entrepreneur, Carol's mission is to expand the concepts of cultural competence and diversity equity and inclusion by adding language access as a key component. She hopes to promote a cultural shift that will result in the effective inclusion and equal access of 29 million multilingual people in people to public and private services and the betterment of their healthcare, justice, education, and outcomes. Of course, she enjoys traveling, movies, dan and dancing flamenco, and she's in Granada, Spain at the moment, so she's going to get to see some of the best flamenco and eat some of the best food in the world. So thank you for joining us, Carol, and you know that as a child of Spanish immigrants, um, this is a, a session is very close to my heart, so I'll let you begin. Thank you, Kat, and thank you everybody who is joining us. I am delighted to be here, and I also want to say kudos to the Immune Deficiency Foundation for going beyond, uh, above and beyond um, with their language access planning, because as Kat said, they are not only offering interpretation, they also have translated numbers of documents, and they are inviting me today to talk about language access and breaking down the language barriers. So as Kat mentioned, I am here to, um, I am here in Spain. I am in fact in a cave, as you can see, perhaps from my background, this is a cave uh, in the mountains where the um, um, gypsies live on, on, many of them still do. And, you know, it has all the amenities of a regular housing, but is actually in the mountain. And I am the founder and CEO of Equal Access Language Services. And my vision is to prevent language-based discrimination or linguicism. And please drop in the chat if you have ever heard of language-based discrimination, just a yes or no would uh, be sufficient. Um, also my mission is, or the mission of my company, I should say, is to help business, businesses and organizations become inclusive through language access. That is my purpose in life. I believe that diversity, equity, and inclusion can only be achieved if we all have equal access. So let's start defining what is language access. Um, please uh, participate in the chat as much as you can. Um, Joan, thank you for dropping that yes uh, with regards to language-based discrimination. Now I ask a different question. Um, have you heard about the topic or the or the concept of language access? I would like to know. Also, a yes or no would be sufficient. Now, what is language access? Language access, Johan, thank you for responding. Um, language access basically means that we need to treat people the same whether they speak English or not and offer an offer access to services regardless of their language. And it's part of a bigger concept called language justice, uh, which is a framework based on the notion of respecting every individual's fundamental language rights. And what are language rights? 
it's a human, it's the, are the human and civil rights concerning, oops, sorry, concerning an individual and collective right to choose the language for communication. So a very important part whenever we have to go to a doctor and perhaps many practitioners here today is effective communication. For limited English proficiency, proficient individuals, um, so that they have an equal opportunity to participate in and enjoy the benefits of a service program or activity of a public entity. So how many times we have encountered a situation where a person does not speak English? Now, if you, if you don't mind telling me in the chat again, if you have ever had or encountered a patient, if that is your... Um, if you if you see patients that don't speak English and they have and you have to overcome the barrier somehow, have is that an experience you've had? Please comment on the chat. And um, now another concept I want to put out there and I will uh, develop it as the presentation evolves is the is the concept of disability because language access doesn't is not only focus on people that don't speak English. It's also uh, relates to people that um, are deaf and hard of hearing and also require language access. But let me just uh, define disability. It says a disability is any condition that makes it more difficult for a person to do certain activities or interact with the world around them. These conditions or impairments may be cognitive, developmental, intellectual, mental, physical, sensory, or a combination of multiple factors. Impairments causing disability might be present from birth or occur during a person's lifetime. So when a person immigrates to a country where they don't speak the language, they have um, an impairment because they don't speak the language, right? So um, I am of the um, belief We cannot talk about disability per se for a person that doesn't speak English. We can call it an impairment in the because they are um, unable to access um, a service, whether that's healthcare, um, legal services, education, any kind of public services. And Joanne says that she had witnessed it as a, as a patient waiting for care and she has observed the impairment or the barrier. Thank you. Very important topic, if my PowerPoint collaborated. Okay, I'm gonna move it here. So how did I start this work? I came to become really passionate about the topic of language access because of a patient I was once interpreting for. Obviously, I'm not going to use his real name or actual picture, but let's name him Jose. Jose was a patient, uh, but before he was a patient, he he emigrated from his country, Honduras, to the United States, seeking better opportunities, but also fleeing the horrors of the gang war. He was going um, to be recruited by the gangs and his family was under threat and he his only option to survive really was to escape Honduras. And he came to, to the United States through the freight train called La Bestia. I'm not sure if you are familiar with that, but it's a it's a it's a um, cargo train. It does it's not for passengers, but a lot of people in Central America, out of desperation, jump on that train and tie themselves with ropes or whatever uh, they can to get it closer to the get closer to the United States. And a lot of them get maimed or killed uh, by doing this. So people are in such desperation that they risk their own lives to try to flee their countries. So that was the case for Jose. He came um, to the United States via that train. And uh, unfortunately, he was caught by immigration and sent back. But because his life was threatened, he started back going, going uh, returning to the United States. And this time he went through the desert and, you know, suffered all sorts of difficulties. Then he arrived to the United States. <clears throat> 
And, you know, he became um, a member of our society, basically. But he experienced additional difficulties that had to do with poverty and also language barriers. So at some point, Jose got really sick and he had to go to the doctor. And unfortunately, the time he went to the doctor, he there was no interpretation available. And this is when I met Jose the second time he comes back. And um, we I work for one of the best hospitals in the world. And he tells me that this was the second time he had to go because uh, last time they didn't have an interpreter, that he had missed a day of work, and that at that at that they had postponed his appointment for uh, two months. So by the time I interpret for Jose, he was obviously sicker, in worse shape, and it made me think: okay, there is a person here whose only asset when he came to the United States was not even a backpack. He had nothing. He only had his own health, his body to be able to work. And uh, our society, we um, didn't make it right by him because we made him wait two more months. We didn't offer language access and he got sicker. So it really shook me, his story, and made me think of the importance of our health, first of all. And I think you all will agree with me that it is definitely our most important asset. It's not our car, it's not our house, it's our health. And language access is a way to really um, improve the outcomes for the limited English proficiency population. And I want to remind people the importance of words and language. And um, I have to thank you, Kat, for playing along today about we, we talk in English and Spanish to sort of um, have some material. And we're going to talk about this at the end that was bilingual. So. Why do I say words can kill? I'm going to tell you briefly another story of another patient uh, that was nearly were, uh, killed by, by a few words. Um, and remind, remember that our health is our most important asset. So the, the, many times, especially in Spanish and English, we have a lot of false cognates, words that look very similar, but they don't mean the, mean, mean the same. So... Willy Ramirez was uh, an athlete who had one day uh, an extreme headache. He didn't feel really well. He went to the hospital. He was Hispanic. And when he reached the hospital, um, there was no interpreter. They just used a family member to interpret for him. And Willy said, creo que estoy intoxicado, right? And the interpretation or the transfer was, I believe I'm intoxicated. And the doctor proceeded to treat Willie as if he had either an overdose or, or not an overdose, sorry, but like he had consumed some kind of drugs or, or alcohol, well, alcohol is a drug, and sort of put him in, a, in an observation room and left him there for a while. It was later discovered that Willie was suffering from an aneurysm and that time was of the essence for Willie. Unfortunately, because the misuse or mistranslation of this word, Willie was, um, was rendered quadriplegic. Obviously, um, his family sued the hospital and uh, the, the settlement reached uh, $72 million. So just for the use of one word, it's a very, very famous case. And I encourage you to, to read about it um, if you are interested. And this is just one example of all the bad things that can happen with a misinterpretation, especially in healthcare. And this is precisely a, the topic of today is healthcare. But our communication is the most important diagnostic tool. And it, when we think about how health um, plays in the in the big, um, in our society, in our 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 um, uh, economy, it really represents one fifth of the total U.S. economy, just healthcare. But twenty percent to forty-seven percent is wasteful spending. That means that 
a lot of that money goes into fixing problems. And 50% of this wasteful spending, or the total, or, I'm sorry, 50% of the total cost of healthcare is generated by 5% of the patients. That they are called frequent flyers and they are usually low income and insured minority patients. So if you read this study where I, where I took this from, um, one of the aspects of wasteful spending is patient safety. And miscommunication plays a big role in patient safety. So it is uh, it stands to reason that these communications caused by lack of language access are costing a tremendous um, amount of money to hospitals. So it's something to think about. Language access is is uh, more than simply an action to be uh, nice to a patient, or or you know, it it actually has a severe. A, a severe economic impact. So let's talk a little bit about language diversity in the US and the LEP population because part of the reasons why I'm doing the work I do is because I really want us to have a shift in our culture, in our understanding of what language access is. So I wanna take you through history and talk about language diversity specifically in the US and provoke you with a question or with a statement. And I definitely want you to put in the chat what do you think about this statement? And I, I'll, I will wait for a little bit. In America, we speak English. I want your opinions. There is no wrong answer. Please um, use the chat to tell me what does that phrase uh, provokes in you, if you will. In America, we speak English. Anybody would like to venture any comment on this? Okay. <laughs> well, don't let me hang in. I would like to know if you um, if you feel it resonates or maybe it doesn't resonate. And again, there is no wrong answer. We're going to uh, precisely talk about this. Yeah, other languages are spoken. Um, now reminded, yeah, um, it can be also a, a sort of a legitimate belief. There are reasons for us to think this way because, um, you know, a lot of people don't, ne don't necessarily encounter limited English proficient uh, people uh, in their daily work. So they have uh, a mindset that uh, basically tells them, well, everywhere, everywhere around me, English is spoken. So yeah, I mean, America will speak English. So there is it's also a legitimate view. But I want to I wanna talk a little bit about the history of either this, not only this statement, but also about our language diversity. There are about 430 languages spoken or signed in the United States, and 177 are indigenous to the area. Unfortunately, there are already 52 languages that are spoken, but this is the map of languages in the U.S. And um, a lot of people believe that the United States, yeah, we have always spoken English and um, and that that's our official language. So th the, our official language, sorry. And it turns out that our founding fathers were such visionaries that they do not or they did not um, declare English an official language. In fact, in the United States, there is no official language because one of their thoughts were like, well, we are a multilingual country if we name one language over another, we're going to have a lot of conflict. Yet, in practice, that's what ended up happening. People thinking that English is actually the official language of the United States. And to um, uh, when we go back in history, at the time of independence, in other words, when we became the United States, one quarter of the population spoke no English, so they were limited English proficient. And two-fifths of that um, 25% spoke German. Then in 1803, the Louisiana Purchase increased the number of limited English proficient population to one third of the population, because as you can see, all of these states were part of the Louisiana Purchase where they spoke French. Then in 1819, Adams on his treaty with Spain that annexed uh, Florida gave us language, they gave us a Spanish, the Spanish language. And then in 1848, 
with the Guadalupe Hidalgo Treaty, added a big portion of Mexico to the United States that also spoke Spanish and other indigenous languages. And then in the 1840s and 50s, Celts and Germans immigrated. In the 70s, and Scandinavians immigrated. 1880 to 1910, Italians, Jews, and Slavs immigrated also to the United States. So we have always been a multilingual country. And But the great paradox is that while the United States historically has been characterized by great linguistic diversity propelled by immigration, it has also been a zone of language extinction in which immigrant tongues die out to be replaced by monolingual English. Um, so that's something for us to think about how we have a perception about our, uh, about our country with, re with regards to language that is based in, um, in a skewed perception of, um, of our diversity. So the truth is that we have never been English only. Uh, this is and the fact that we have had different, uh, you know, a, a specific history has brought about this linguistic like, diversity. So it helps us with that. Uh, it, it helps us chew that statement of in America, we speak English in a different way. We can at least debunk a little bit our perception that that is a, a true statement. Now, um, not only uh, we don't have a we have a, a rich history of language diversity in the United States, we also have laws and regulations that would help your practice become more inclusive. In fact, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 said that no person in the United States shall, on the grounds of race, color of national origin, be excluded from participating in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. And here we mean national origins, it equates language. So if you run a program of you have even $1 by the federal government, you cannot discriminate a person because they don't speak English and you have to have meaningful access to them, which is a separate, um, the, the law that talks about that is actually an executive order on, on how to implement that Title VI. is executive order 13166 that President Clinton signed into in, in 2000, and it says improving access to services for persons with limited English proficiency. So this executive order tells programs that are run by the federal, uh, no, not run by the federal government, I'm sorry, but that receive federal funding uh, through grants directly or indirectly, it, it provides a guide on how to provide language access services. So, Many of us uh, that operate on a regular basis in the United States don't, don't even know about these laws. Or for example, use uh, children to interpret, which is not part of what adequate access is. Or um, I don't know, use uh, not only family members, children, but uh, an app or whatever. And forget that people with limited English proficiency it is a protected population basically. So unfortunately, because we are so blindsided to this problem, the limited English proficient uh, population suffers at a rate of 4% severe temporary harm when compared to English proficient people. So the, the disparities for limited English proficient persons is, 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 are tremendous. And if you attended the conference this uh, morning by Dr. Um, Rochester, uh, she she mentioned uh, briefly about language disparities and, and healthcare equity. And this is what we see today. They experience worse outcome, outcomes than the English speaking population. And this is taken from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. So how do these disparities affect LEP patients? They usually face longer hospital stays, greater difficulty understanding discharge instructions because they are not given in, English, in Spanish or other languages, 
they are often readmitted for certain chronic conditions. And they, there was another study done uh, to see what would happen with, um, with limited English proficient patients if we use ad hoc interpreters, meaning just bilingual people, uh, versus using professional interpreters versus using no interpreters. So they had um, 57 encounters in the study, 20 with professional interpreters, 27 with ad hoc interpreters, meaning bilingual people with no training, 10 with no interpreters. And they um, uncovered that those interactions produce 1,884 interpreter errors. And 18% of those errors had potential clinical consequences. And so they were obviously using bilingual people that are not trained caused the greatest percentage of errors. No interpreters was actually slightly better than using a bilingual person, but not by by much, and obviously using qualified interpreters um, reduce the number of errors significantly. And, and I am of the belief that qualified interpreters have to be trained more and more. So right now in the United States, the standard for a qualified healthcare interpreter is 40 hours of interpreting in, in, um, in healthcare, specifically medical interpretation, in addition to being bilingual, obviously. They receive the training when they are already bilingual. But the point here is that a person that provides interpretation services has to be qualified. Because what goes into language is not only, you know, definitions, it's a culture. And what is culture? It's a group of ideas, values, thoughts, emotions. So language is a key to access social justice and peace. So when we talk about um, cultural competence, and I am sure you are all very familiar with the term cultural competence and diversity, equity, and inclusion, there is one piece that is often missing. And trust me, I, um, I have done um, myself courses in diversity, equity, and inclusion, and, and have and understand or uh, have delved in the topic of cultural competence and realize that language is always mentioned as part of the intersectionality of an individual, but language access as a tool is really not included. So this is in what our very particular view of, of language access we think is missing, right? So when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and then access, we're not only thinking of um, ramps for handicapped people, we think about language as an essential component of this um, concept, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Because when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, it tends to be very focused on what happens internal to an organization, but we forget the people that we serve. And in the United States, we have 25.9 million people that don't speak English. So we are living in our diversity, equity, and inclusion plan. We're leaving nearly 9% of the population in our planning on diversity, equity, and inclusion. That is the size of South of North Korea. It's a huge amount of people that we are leaving out of our diversity, equity, and inclusion planning. So what inclusion are we talking about when we're leaving such a big population out of our planning? So I constantly um, I constantly oh, sorry, I, I, apparently there is no chat. Yeah, I, I actually only see uh, very bits of chat of chatting. I'm not sure if people are uh, chatting, but um, I'm not sure what happens with the chat. But I I just see a uh, few responses. Um, sorry. So now that we think about this in a little bit in a slightly different way. Um, or we expand our concept of diversity, equity, and inclusion, we really need to think about this, this population. We cannot uh, 
just relegate the use of the concept to um, only race and gender. Let's uh, also say that language and uh, national origin are interconnected with race. So we can expand uh, the whole category to include people from different national origins that don't speak the language. So I want I want you to really take take that away with you. So now we're going to talk uh, about effective ways to offer language access, which is the tools that you can use in your practice. So I uh, took these tips from a body of work that's called the class standards. And um, they were defined in the 2000s as well. And I'm just talking about a few of those standards. We obviously don't have a, but only one hour. So I'm going, to, I selected the most relevant ones uh, that talk about language. So when you are working with a specific population, you need to assess the need for an interpreter, how well a person can understand and communicate in English. So if the person requests an interpreter, that's a reason to offer an interpreter. If the person speaks English as a second language and it and is in a stressful, complex, or unfamiliar situation, let's let's think about healthcare. When when a family is bringing their child to the consultation because they are concerned about their health, it's not the time to um, to test their level of English. It's a time to provide interpretation so that they can communicate in a language they can understand. The third reason is when it's difficult to understand, the person is difficult to understand. So they often will respond only in a limited way. That is a clue, right? So I am fascinated by how people would say, oh, I think he speaks English. He, I think he understands English simply because a person nods, starting with like the fact I'm nodding is such a common response to um, not necessarily to show agreement, but to show that you're hearing the other person to empathize, but you might not be understanding. And who are we to, to, to decide what is in the other person's brain and decide, oh yeah, he's, he understands English, he understands English. And it's often done like, obviously um, a, the person means well, but we cannot make that assessment. If the person is responding in an only a limited way, it is a time perhaps to offer an interpreter. Um, another um, clue is that they will rely on family or friends to interpret, right? Or simply they wish to communicate in his preferred language. Maybe I am bilingual, let's say, but if the situation is such that I don't feel comfortable speaking in, in this, the language of the country. I could ask for an interpreter. The other clue is that the person cannot grasp or respond to questions in English. So a very good way to determine the person's understanding, even with an interpreter, is asking for a sort of explanation back to you. Like you, you have explained a concept or something, try to find out how much they understand by asking, well, a, what did you understand basically? But the other part that we need to take into consideration is that the interpreter is not only for the limited English proficient person, the interpreter is also for us as providers, right? The question is how well I can understand and communicate in the language of the patient. So, and again, Kat, thank you for playing along. Kat said, uh, you know, I'm tired. I don't, I don't, uh, want us to continue using Spanish, let's switch to English. That can happen to you. You might be bilingual, but it turns out that your level of Spanish or uh, uh, the second language that you have is not good enough for that communication to happen. So you should use an interpreter as well. Or if the person is trying to communicate in English and insisting that they have to use, that, that they can do it in English, but you don't understand their English, you also have a right to have an interpreter present because you need to understand because communication is the most important diagnostic tool, effective communication. The other um, tool or, or um, tip is that you must ensure 
the competence of the individuals providing language assistance. Recognizing that the use of untrained individuals and or minors as interpreters should be avoided. So um, there are several ways to do this. One is the ILR self-assessment and the other one is language testing is international. The ILR self-assessment is something that you can, uh, and this, this stands for inter, um, interprofession, uh, sorry, I am forgetting the, the acronym. But this assessment is what the government uses to assess the language skills of uh, people uh, working in the foreign service. And there is a self-assessment that is free. You can download it from the internet. And if a person is um, proficient in another language, they will, they will have a score of three or above. And then that person can then train to become interpreter and um, or, or not, or can use their language, it all depends. So if you are a provider and you speak another language and you are unsure about how, how well you speak that other language, you can take that self-assessment and determine whether or not you should communicate in that language or you uh, could benefit from the use of an interpreter. Never use a minor. The reasons are plenty, but just think about a minor explaining a very complex genetic disorder where not i mean not uh, sometimes not even professional interpreters will will know the vocabulary unless they have prepared for example all the interpreters that are here today have taken hours of preparation to be able to interpret because they need these glos glossaries ahead of time so imagine when you put a child to do an interpretation of i don't know a a, a particular disease causing possibly a trauma Right now, there is an, actually a 20-minute film on, on children that interpret for their families. They are, and it, it really causes uh, concern to have 11 million children in the United States providing a professional work interpretation and paid. So when we think about child labor, we don't think of the United States providing child labor, right? Or, or doing or forcing children to have to do a, a job they are not qualified to do or or basically forcing them to, to be in a position that could be even traumatic for many of them when they have to deliver bad news to a parent or they are asked to fill out immigration forms. I mean, the list is very long. Please do not use minor for, minors for interpretation. The, other tip comes from standard number eight, that is provide easy to understand print and multilingual media materials and uh, signage in the languages commonly used by the population in the service area. So if you are, if the population you work with is uh, majority Afghani from Afghanistan, then Farsi would be the majority of the, your documents. So get familiar with the population you're serving and um, offer written materials and, and uh, signs in that language. There are different models of access. Today with the with technology, we really have absolutely no reason to offer interpretation because it can be done remotely. It can be done through a phone, through a tablet, through a computer. There are many ways. And also offer a translation of vital documents like pay, uh, consent forms, HIPAA forms, all, the, all those documents need to be translated. And also explanation about medicines, um, it's, it's key for patients. And most pharmacies, if you put, if you are prescribing a medicine and you put, please print the information about this medicine and the instructions in Spanish, let's say, many pharmacies can do that. And this is also a way, uh, as we are closing uh, the talk here, this is a, well, a way to do well by doing good. We, we have seen with the people that I serve, uh, my, my clients, that um, they really benefit um, from offering language access because then they, they have uh, people from the community that come to their service and they don't feel push out in a sense from the service because they, they are offering language access. And this is actually uh, the quote that inspires me to do this work. Uh, Ruth Bader, just, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, 
if you want to be a true professional, you will do something outside yourself, something to repair tears in your community, something to make life a little better for people less fortunate than you. That's what I think a meaningful life is, living not for oneself, but for one's community. And I want to raise awareness about this particular community that unfortunately is not a community per se. There is no like gathering of LEP persons or there is not an, an identity associated with the with being limited English proficient. Uh, and like, for example, there is an identity about being um, Hispanic or a... Um, African American or 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 Colombian, whatever. But being limited English is not an identity. So I want to call the your attention to a, a community that's kind of like formless, right? And um and the, but this community is suffering because we are not providing effective language access to all of them. So I actually am in a in a mission to make this concept. A, a common concept. I want. I get a lot of blank stares when I ask if they, if a person knows what language access is. They don't necessarily know, and that's fine. I want to teach about this, so I want to make language access a a a, a buzzword, if you will, a, a concept that becomes so common and so pervasive in people's uh, practices, in schools everywhere that everybody will know how what to do and how to uh, how to act and the last concept i want to emphasize here, here is that if language is not a barrier limited english proficient persons can be agents of change in their own lives they need to be autonomous in communicating and the way to be autonomous is providing these tools and resources i actually love the phrase that the the presenter today um, offer about when you, by Maja Angelou, and um, about if you know better, then do better. I love that. But I, I'm going to leave you also with um, another one by uh, another poet, wonderful poet, Amanda Gorman. She said, we've learned that what quiet isn't always peace and the norms and notions of what just is, isn't always justice. And I apologize to my interpreter because this is not exactly translatable in, in Spanish. Um, but it, I want you to think that language access and language barriers, we are so used to the fact that they are just are, right? And we need to change that to, to think that it is unjust not to provide language access. And I want to leave you with resources. Uh, if you go to this QR code, you're going to find all the laws that I mentioned today. They are uh, all the definitions also, what are language rights, human rights, um, effective communication here on the left, what are the laws associated with language access, how to offer language access effectively, and also how to recruit professionals to um, to bridge the language gap. So this is this one tool will uh, help you a lot in your practice. And finally, um, I just want to mention that I created a podcast just on language access. It's called Language Access Matters. And if you want to hear more about what language access is, how um, what how how the law works around language access, please listen to the podcast. Um, we are in. We just released our first episode. It has been released in Spanish. Um, it has subtitles and also in English. So um, this is also a tool and please support us by listening. And now, if you have any questions, I welcome all of them. Uh, before we do questions, I yes. am going to talk about um, the resources that we have here in at IDF to help our Spanish speakers and not just our Spanish speakers. I'm very proud. Um, of IDF and our initiatives to give those non-English speak speakers um, access to our resources. I'm going to start off first with uh, talking about what we do have in Spanish, because um, we do have lots of our publications um, translated into Spanish. We have our IDF patient family handbook. Um, we have a zebra tail. I believe I'm sharing my screen, but probably no, not. No, no, you're not. Mm -mm. Okay, here we go. 
There we are. I think I am sharing it now. Um, so we do have our idea of patient and family handbook, um, our zebra tale, El Cuento de una Cebra. Um, we have our immune system. Um, we have a, uh, we are working on trying to gather up a support group for Spanish speakers. Um, so if we have any Spanish speakers out there that are interested in, um, in un grupo de apoyo in Espanol, a support group in, in Spanish, a get connected group, please reach out to uh, myself or to uh, free um, to get that going again. We have lots of educational videos and inspirational stories discussing everyday life with PI. Um, and I am most proud to say that um, these are some additional links uh, to find the resources in Spanish. But I'm most proud that our resources for SCID not only come in Spanish, but come in a variety of languages. Um, we have Arabic, French, German, Hebrew, Korean, Navajo, uh, Portuguese, simplified Chinese, um, Tagalog, Filipino, and um, Vietnamese. And my apologies for uh, butchering um, Filipino. But I'm most proud of IDF for uh, being so equitable in our access to those who do not speak Spanish. Um, this is a very, a very close to home topic for me. Um, because I was one of those kids that was translating for their parents. And this was at a time when I didn't even really have a good grasp of English. I mean, think about a six-year-old English speaker, a native speak English speaker. Try to have them explain a medical condition to an adult in English, in a language native to them. Uh, it's it's difficult. So to have a child to then take a language that is secondary to them and to try to explain such con, con, um, complex um, information, let it be medical or any other adult topic is um, quite insane that I was allowed to do that. So uh, I reiterate, please do not use children as interpreters. It's also a huge, weird reversal of parent-child role, um, which can also lead to lots of issues in the long run. Um, yes, thanks for sharing that. It is very concerning to me that we use that practice today. Yeah, you would not believe, um, you know, as as I was a social worker for my county and um, I did lots of interpreting um, and a lot of my own coworkers uh, sometimes would not take me along or take, um, you know, use the resources like the language line. Uh, to translate conversations and would use the kids that they were there to protect and 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 and, and investigate allegations of abuse um, against their own parent. So now talk let's talk like let's talk about that. So you have to translate yeah. a conversation about treatment of abuse that you were the victim of with your abuser. How how strange of, a, of a, a, a thing to ask a child to do. So thank you so much for your information. We do have a few minutes to take some uh, questions. However, those questions have all gone to you, Carol. So um, if you yeah, have any, if sure. you see any questions out there, uh, feel free to read them. Oh, uh, sure. It, I think it's because people are asking me directly, but I incur, uh, but there are no questions actually. Um, I think it was just, um, direct messages but yes i encourage people if they if you have questions to instead of directing them directly to me put everyone in the meeting that way everybody can see the question or the response um that's why you were not able to see that yeah. the questions but uh joanne it says there was a great presentation to everyone excellent thank you joanne thank you for your participation um and uh well, while you think of a question, I want to ask you, how did it feel the very beginning of the presentation when we only spoke Spanish and uh, we were even giving instructions on how to use the interpreter? Anybody wants to venture some comments, like slightly, uh, you felt slightly, what, uncomfortable or out of it, or maybe you spoke Spanish, I don't know, but I want to hear your your feedback on that 
especially if you got here a little bit late and Carol and I were just speaking Spanish to one another. Um, what did that, what did that feel like? What were your thoughts there? I was paying close attention and trying to understand. Yes, John. Yeah, and that's actually what a lot of people do in English too. They try mm -hmm. to speak, to uh, pay close attention. I've seen my parents who are limited English proficient uh, interacted in the US, interacting in the U.S., they they grasp a word and then they make all these meanings around that word. And I'm like, no, that unfortunately that's not what the lady is saying. Really, no, isn't that what she said? She said suitcase, and I understand suitcase, so she's definitely <laughs> talking about. And I'm like, no, that. So, thank you for sharing that, Joan. Any other uh, any other uh, thoughts or comments about how it feels to be out of the loop? Now imagine if you were not just chatting here, but stick in a place where nobody understood you. That yeah, if that was your daily life, if you had to navigate in environments where you did not speak that language. Um, I also like to think about it whenever one of my friends goes to travel somewhere abroad or um, somewhere else, and they always return and say, well, I have a better understanding of how people, uh, you know, navigate. I have a better understanding of what it's like to be in a, in a country where I don't speak that language and I, I can't find, you know, uh, where I'm supposed to go. And it's hard for me to ask directions because no one speaks English and, and I don't speak their language. So it's, it's difficult for sure. Um, so I really want to thank you for the work that you and your interpreters do. Um, it's great work. It's really great information. We do need to remember that we are a multilingual country we are a mosaic of cultures and languages and always have been, um, is definitely not English first. Um, Thank so, you, Kat. Yeah, for sure. I think we forget that sometimes. Um, but I just want to thank you again. And I want to thank everyone who has come here today to support. Um, <laughs> I recently traveled <laughs> to Spain and can only ask where the bathroom is. Yeah, that's right. And sometimes people joke with me when I say, oh, I'm bilingual, and they say, oh, I can say two things. Donde está el baño? Y and, and, you know, donde está la biblioteca? Where's the bathroom? Where's the <laughs> library? And I'm like, well, you're not going to get very far there. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Francis, for sharing that. It is, um, it is perhaps enlightening how when we don't speak the language of the country where we're traveling, how we can become in an instant limited X proficiency, right? Because once you leave the country, you can be in that position yourself. So it's, it's always uh, fluctuating. So we, we need to remember that when we travel, we are, we are likely to be limited Spanish provision, limited Portuguese provision, and we wish, and this is why I want to make this a global cause. I, I think that the more awareness we have, the more protection we will have uh, at home in the United States, but also, People abroad will understand, oh, okay, this person needs an interpreter. There are countries that are far, um, that are pursuing language access uh, in, a, in a big way. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I hope in the US we do it too. Yes, likewise, likewise. If anyone has any questions, um, we still have a few minutes that we can take some or any comments that you would like to make. Um, if not, then. Uh, then uh, we will um, say goodbye. And again, thank you again to you and your interpreters um, for translating not only this session, but the other ones that uh, we had going today at the PI conference. Thank, thank you, God. I think we're going to stop the interpreting recording. And uh, yeah. thank you, everybody, for participating. Please remember that you have a, a plethora of resources with those QR codes. So please use them. They are free. They are downloadable. And also listen to the podcast, please. And obviously, if you want to connect uh, offline with me, uh, you can do so through LinkedIn and uh, the contact information I shared earlier. But let me just... Uh, yeah, I, I put it on the on the presentation. So please do that. I look forward to hearing from all of you. Thank and you. And thank you to all. Um, and please continue to join us for our um, sessions throughout today, the rest of today and tomorrow for our PI conference.